John, thank you so much and uh, good evening, everybody. I want to thank you for taking time off your busy schedules to attend uh, the Tyre and Polyfluoroalkali Substance uh, or PFAS, as is commonly known, public informational meeting. Um, I know you may all have very good questions uh, for us, and we believe we have uh, ample time at the end of the meeting for you to, to do that. I want to introduce the panel attendees. Uh, again, my name is Norman Kumalo, the town manager. We have John Westerling, the director of public works, Eric Carter, the water and sewer manager, Sean McAuliffe, the board of health director, uh, William Miller, uh, the fire chief and emergency management director, uh, and from the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection, we have Mary Jude Pixley, uh, the regional director, uh, Robert Bostwick, uh, the drinking water program section chief, and uh, from Western and Samsung engineers who are our consultants, we have uh, Leah Stanton, uh, who is the vice president. And John, take over. Thank you very much, Mr. Kamalo. Uh, please forgive me if you see me switching back and forth. I just want to make sure that there's no one in the waiting room. Uh, the agenda for tonight's meeting, I'm going to discuss Hopkinton's water distribution system and the steps that the town has taken to date. And then I'm going to turn it over to Mary Jude Pigsley, who's going to talk about what are PFAS, uh, PFAS exposure concerns, health effects of PFAS, Massachusetts regulation of PFAS, sampling requirements, Hopkinton's PFAS results, uh, public education requirement, what is Mass DEP doing about PFAS? US EPA PFAS strategic roadmap. How to obtain more information. And finally, any questions that we have. Just want to go over what our water distribution system is. This is the town of Hopkinton. We have eight drinking water wells, and we also purchase water from the town of Ashland. If you can see over in the upper left-hand corner here where my cursor is moving around, we have wells number one, two, and three. Just below that, we have wells four and five by Whitehall Reservoir. Well, number six is over here across the street from wells one, two, and three off of Fruit Street. And then we have the Alprilla Farm wells number seven and eight, which are off of Alprilla Farm Road. And then, as I mentioned, we also purchase water from uh, Howe Street Wells from the town of Ashland. And what you'll notice is that all of these pipes are interconnected. So when people ask, when people ask whether or not they're getting water from the affected well number six, because all of our water becomes one once it's pumped into the system, we can't tell you definitively whether or not you are receiving water from well number six or not. And that's why the public education materials went out to the entire uh, community and everyone who is a, a water customer. Um, what are the steps that have been taken by the town thus far? We mailed public education materials to all water customers and distributed it by social media platforms, and we also sent a flyer out in the Hopkinton Independent. We populated the DPW website with PFAS information and links, and that is the long-winded way of saying where our website is. But if you go to the town of Hopkinton MA website, under departments, Department of Public Works, you'll see a link to PFAS. And that's got a lot of great information, all of the public education materials, and links to further information that are provided by the town and by DEP. We tested our other water sources to ensure that they do not exceed the maximum contaminant level for PFAS of 20 parts per trillion. And we continue to blend the water at the Fruit Street Water Treatment Facility to reduce PFAS levels at that location. We have been investigating treatment options to remove PFAS. We continue to answer questions from the public and provide PFAS information. Uh, the two primary questions that we've been receiving are, 
Am I receiving water from the affected well? And as I stated previously, all of our water combines into one, so we can't answer that. We have to err on the side of caution and state that you are uh, possibly receiving water from that well. And then also folks are asking, they are on a private well, can they test for PFAS or should they be concerned? Uh, on our website, there is a link uh, to a known laboratory that will test for PFAS. And also on DEP's website, they have links to laboratories that are certified. Uh, finally, we have received a preliminary report from our consultant for a possible connection to the MWRA water supply pipeline in Southboro. With that, I am going to turn it over to Mary Jude Pigsley once I share her PowerPoint presentation. Bear with me one moment, please. Can everyone see that? I can see it. Perfect. Um, and Mary Jude, at your command, I will advance to the next slide. All right, I'll start right here on this one. Um, my name is Mary Jude Pigsley. I'm the regional director for the Mass DEP office in Worcester. Thank you very much for the invitation to be here. The uh, central region is 77 cities and towns right in the middle of the state. We go from the border of New Hampshire down to um, Connecticut and Rhode Island, and we start in Southboro and go west to the Brookfields. Um, Bob Bostwick, the drinking water program section chief for all of those towns uh, is with me tonight also. He oversees the 400 plus public water systems that are in the region from our largest in Worcester to our smallest, which are some condominiums, uh, donut shops, other things that serve more than 25 people per day. So I'm gonna talk primarily about public water supply regulation. Um, I can respond to questions about private wells if those come up, MassDEP doesn't regulate private wells, but the information about PFAS is the same regardless of what kind of regulated water it appears in. So I'm happy to answer questions about private wells if people have those also. My slides are not that long. There are 16 of them, including this one, um, but there's a lot of information in them. I talk fast, but I try not to. Some of the information is complicated. Some of it includes math. So um, if you bear with me, I'll get through the slides and then happy to go over anything else in more detail. And as John noted, I'm gonna talk about what are PFAS, why does Mass DEP regulate, PFAS, why are we talking about PFAS in Hopkinton specifically, and what is DEP, DEP and the federal government, what are we doing about PFAS in drinking water? So next slide. So PFAS are poly and, plural, poly and perfluoral alkyl substances. They're, um, they are man-made chemicals with an incredibly strong bond between carbon and fluorine uh, molecules. They are extremely stable. This is one of the strongest chemical bonds uh, that, that you can have. I was gonna say found in nature, but they are, are man-made chemicals, thousands of them. They are heat resistant, stain resistant. They repel water. They don't break down. They don't biodegrade to incinerate them. You have to burn them at 900 degrees Celsius. So people have taken to calling them the forever chemicals and it's, that's pretty much true. Um, they are water soluble, so they dissolve in the water and some of them are very toxic. We're not talking about all of the thousands of them, but some of them have health effects, serious health effects that we'll um, cover in some later slides specifically. So the next slide, you can find PFAS in a ton of different things in your home. Um, things that are basically non-stick, slippery things. They're water resistant, they're grease resistant. It's uh, not supposed to use trade names, but I th think you'll figure out, you know, um, fabric treatments. Like if you have something that you spray on your furniture that makes it water resistant. If you have a hiking jacket that is water resistant, um, things that are 
paper coatings on like takeout containers that you get from a salad bar that are, um, that are waterproof. They don't leak through or grease proof, ski wax, floor wax, all of these different things. Most notably the uh, firefighting foam that's known as aqueous film forming foam, AFFF, was used in a lot of fires, particularly around military bases. And that's been a large part of the PFAS contamination that's been found in public water supplies all across the country and, and here in, um, in the central region in Massachusetts. We have, unfortunately, the distinction of all the four regions of DEP having the most PFAS uh, sites by far the, the communities or public water systems that have PFAS contamination for a, a variety of reasons, some of which is the proximity to Devons up in the northern part of the region. So most Americans, because of all of these consumer related products, um, have been exposed to PFAS through drinking water, but also through these consumer products. Next slide. So the exposures of concern for PFAS, this is why we're regulating PFAS. Some of this information you saw in the public education materials that uh, John talked about that were sent out on October 1st, but uh, you know people have a lot of questions about the public health aspects of this. So I wanted to go into a little more detailed information about the exposures to certain sensitive groups. And as it was noted in the public education materials, those groups are pregnant women, nursing mothers, infants, and immune compromised people who are drinking and cooking with contaminated water in a residential setting. So all of those words go to the things that are important to think about when you're talking about risk assessment is, what is the sensitivity? What is the sensitivity of that group? What are the concentrations in the water and how frequently are you drinking the water? So if you are in a sensitive group and you're in a residential setting, that exposure is of higher concern than if you're not in a sensitive group and you're drinking the water at your workplace, not at home, and you're not cooking with it. And it's cooking for foods that absorb water like rice or pasta. Um, but you can wash your vegetables, you can take a bath or a shower. So the exposure is for the sensitive groups, pregnant women, nursing mothers, infants, and immune compromised people in a residential setting. If you are exposed in that way, you can make choices about limiting your exposure. And that would be to drink and cook with bottled water. If you are drinking water that has any PFAS in it, even below the state standard, you still may feel risk averse and want to do that. And that's completely up to you. Um, we have on our website, a link to the Department of Public Health, which approves anybody who, any company that sells water in the Commonwealth. They have a list of all the bottled water companies that have submitted their testing results, not just for PFAS, but for all the drinking water chemicals that are regulated. And it shows on that website, all of the companies that have passed that have submitted data showing that their drinking water meets our drinking water standards. And I'm gonna say this a lot. Um, the link is on our website. There is a ton of good stuff on our website. There are links that have links that have links. You can get as deeply into some of this toxicity information, how the standard was derived, um, information about private wells. So look at MassDEP's website. Um, if you want to reduce your exposure, you can put on treatment of your, uh, at your house. You can put on a treatment system that tests all of the water coming to your house, or you can put a treatment system on that is just at your tap. The, uh, it used to be called the National Science Foundation, I think, but it's now just known as NSF. It's a national organization that certifies uh, certain things, including water treatment devices. The NSF certification or stamp of approval is available on some water treatment technologies, but we'll talk about later about the different standards across the country. That certification is to remove two specific PFAS chemicals to a level of 70 parts per trillion, which is the EPA federal health advisory. 
there is no home water treatment system that is, is certified to meet DEP standard yet. The NSF website is updated literally every day. Um, companies are working very hard to come up with a treatment system that can treat to these lower numbers. So again, we have a link on our website to the NSF website where you can get information from them and you can actually call them. They have a customer service line. I've called it myself, they're super helpful. So if you have questions about treatment systems, you can reach out to the, uh, to the NSF. The next slide. So these are, these are some of the health effects that I was talking about. This is why we regulate the PFAS chemicals that we regulate. We regulate several, six of the longer chain. They have more of those carbon bonds um, and the science has shown that the longer chain PFAS are the more toxic. So these are some of the health effects that led MassDEP to come up with both the drinking water standard and a groundwater cleanup standard. In the next slide. You'll see on the next slide, these are health effects associated with high exposures to the long chain PFAS. And this slide includes not just the effects on the sensitive subpopulations, but also the longer term sort of lifetime exposure effects, including increased cancer risks. All of this information um, can be found at the link on on this slide, but also that link is on our website. Um, the ATSDR is part of the is part of the um, CDC. It's the Agency for Toxic. Uh, I always forget what it is. Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. I think um, they come up with the toxicity values that we would use in actually setting a standard. So there's a lot of information, very technical information. But if you're looking for that, you can find that on the ATSDR website. So that's what are PFAS and why do we regulate them? And the next slide talks about when people first started looking for PFAS. The drinking water regulations that we have um, are part of the Federal Safe Drinking Water Act. We are delegated to, uh, to implement the federal regulations for safe drinking water and add some of our own in Every five years or so, the EPA comes out with a list of chemicals that are not regulated, that they would like public water suppliers to look for and see if they pop up with some regularity across the country, and maybe EPA should regulate them. And that's called, not surprisingly, the Unregulated Contaminant Monitoring Rule. In the third round of the UCMR, um, public water suppliers that serve more than 10,000 people had to monitor for PFAS. That was not Hopkinton. Um, but other communities in Massachusetts did fall under the unregulated contaminant monitoring rule, looked for PFAS, found PFAS. So that coupled with what's going on in the rest of the country where PFAS is appearing in sometimes very high levels in other public water supplies, MassDEP started looking at regulating PFAS in the drinking water and as a cleanup standard, where there's a hazardous waste site and the groundwater is being cleaned up. If that water is being used or could be used for drinking water, like a private well, um, the same standard applies. So the drinking water regulation, which is called a maximum contaminant level is 20 parts per trillion. The cleanup standard for groundwater is 20 parts per trillion because the science is the same. And it all comes down to, again, the six chemicals that are longer chain and the exposure to the sensitive subpopulations. And as I said, Hopkinton was not part of this, um, of this initial regulatory uh, effort. The next slide. But since we issued the rule last October, Hopkinton and all of the public water systems in the Commonwealth, except for uh, the ones that don't serve the same people every day, like a donut shop, um, are subject to this maximum contaminant level. I put the citation on there. There are some people who really like to read the regulations and see exactly what it says. I will say to you, good luck with that. Um, there is a link to it on our website. It is one of the more complicated drinking water rules that we have. Um, and if you, if you do decide to read it, you need to read it several times over to sort of get the gist of it. I'm gonna walk through what the requirements are 
but you're certainly welcome to read that. It sets a standard of 20 parts per trillion for a concentration of six specific PFAS compounds. And as I said, it's health-based and it's protective of the most sensitive populations. So therefore it's, sent, it's uh, protective of all people if you set the standard low enough to protect the most sensitive populations. And it does include the cumulative effect of PFAS from other sources in your food, in the packaging, in other places in, in the environment. So the next slide. The regulation was phased in um, starting in January of this year, starting from the largest systems, the over 50,000 systems had to start monitoring in January and the smallest systems, which includes Hopkinton, the under 10,000 have to start monitoring this month. The first year of the rule requires quarterly sampling. So once every three months, the water system would take a sample. And the regulation also provides that every three years, MassDEP has to go through another round of reviewing the science and see whether we need to change the PFAS standard. We're not waiting three years to do that. Our Office of Research and Standards is constantly following the science, constantly updating information, putting that information on the website. It's certainly possible that the standard could change in fewer than three years, but the, the regulation actually requires that we, we review that. The next slide. All right, so here's, here's where we start doing math and um, well, I'll get to the results, how, what this means for Hopkinton, but the compliance, as I said, is based on a quarterly sample and it's at each place that the water enters the distribution system, the map that John had put up there. I think there are four entry points in Hopkinton, so you don't need to sample each individual well. The regulation only requires you to sample the water where it enters the system where people are gonna be drinking it. If any PFAS chemical, not just the six that we regulate, if any PFAS chemical is detected in the sample, the first sample that's taken, you have to take a second sample. And that's because number one, the standard is so very low. And number two, the possibility of cross-contamination exists. If you're using a waterproof notebook, that could be a problem. If there was Teflon tape in the plumbing fixture that the sample came from, there are, diff there are ways that PFAS could show up that are basically cross-contamination. So the initial sample is added to the confirmation sample divided by two. It's an average, and that's the number that we take to show compliance with the 20 parts per trillion. So it's a sample taken at the entry point to the distribution system, and it's an average of two samples, an initial sample and a confirmation sample. If that initial sample is over 10, which is half the standard, then the system is not on quarterly monitoring anymore, they're on monthly monitoring. And that's the situation that's occurring now in Hopkinton, and um, I'll talk about the data in a minute. So if the average is over than over 20 for three samples in a quarter, because it's a quarterly average, that's a violation of the standard and the water supplier has to distribute public notice materials. That's not what happened in Hopkinton. We go to the next slide. So if you look at the table, and maybe it's hard to read, I, I apologize. Um, I've shaded the lines that show the finished water, the treated water that's going out into the system, not the water that's straight at the wells, because you're not drinking the water straight from the wells. You're drinking the water that's, that's either blended with other ones or, or treated going out into the system. So the first sample that the town took was back in July, which as you know, is before October. So I really commend the town for getting out ahead of this. MassDEP offered every single water supplier in the state that had to sample for, for PFAS. Um, we offered to do that initial and confirmation sample for them for free because it's a new rule. It's a complicated rule. We wanted to try to help our, our um, municipal partners in complying with this rule. So Hopkinton signed up in advance, which was great. Uh, which was not so great is the initial sample came back at 20.9, which triggered a confirmation sample in August, which came back at 20.5. 20 the average of those two is 20.7. And for purposes of this rule, we round 
So 20.7 is 21. 21 is more than 20. It's only one result because it's, you know, you combine the two for, th for this purpose. Um, so that triggers what we call public education materials, not public notice. We don't call it a violation because we don't have three samples to average, but we want people to be aware of the information that's in that public education materials that talks about the sensitive cell populations, what the risks are, what the results were in Hopkinton, and that's the information that the town mailed out on October 1st. October 1st. Because they were on monthly sampling at that point, the third sample came in at 24.7. So now we have the three months for quarter three, we have July, August, September, and you do that average and it comes out to 22. So technically now we do have a violation which triggers public notice, which is a little bit different from the public education materials. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But you can see from the chart that the, the source water, the, the individual wells were sampled back in July, and it was pretty clear that the problem well was, was the well number six at Fruit Street, which was at 35.936. All of the other wells were below 10, and so those entry points are not on monthly sampling, but the Fruit, Fruit Street station will continue to sample monthly. The next slide. The public education materials that went out are um, a form that we provide to the water suppliers. So everybody who has to do public education sends the same information. They don't get to make it up themselves. It's a very dense document. I apologize for that. Um, there's just a, a lot of information. It's technical information. It may be hard to read. I'm sure if, if the town were to um, rewrite it, it would be probably easier to read, but they don't have that option. So as you know, it presents the sampling results. It explains the drinking water standard. It says that it's not a violation because the standard is based on that quarterly average. It describes the health effects and it, it talks about the other information about what the town is doing. The public notice that will now be required to be mailed 30-ish um, days from now um, will look very much the same, except in the first paragraph, it will say, this is a violation of the MCL and the drinking water standard because it is based on the quarterly average and it will say what those readings were that I had in the previous slide. So nothing has really changed. You're not, you're not getting two pieces of mail um, because there's anything dramatically different. It's just sort of a quirk of timing that the, that the September and October results came in so close to each other if they, had, um, if they had been maybe four days closer, it would have been one document that went out. So I just, I, I don't want there to be confusion about why you're getting two separate pieces of mail. It's a mass DEP requirement and they are slightly different even though they're gonna look very much the same. The next slide. So what MassDEP is doing about this, we developed the drinking water standards and the cleanup standards that I just talked about. We're doing a lot of technical assistance um, and outreach to the municipalities, to the condominium owners, the restaurant owners, the schools, um, any public water supplier who is having to sample for the PFAS. And then if they find PFAS taking the next steps, it's um, we're doing a lot of these meetings with customers of the water supplies or residents just to explain this because it is so complicated and we're happy to answer questions about it. We worked with fire departments across the state uh, with a firefighting foam take back program if anybody had any of that legacy AFFF foam um, because there are foams now that have either different PFAS or no PFAS in them. We took back the, the AFFF foam from fire departments who found it and we had that incinerated at, at our cost, so we did that. We are working when we have water supplies that have PFAS in, we try to figure out where is it coming from. And as I said, like up around Devons, it's pretty obvious where it's coming from. They have an airfield, they had fires at the airfield, they had multiple fire stations at Devons. I mean, that's, that there's, there's a super fun site there. That's pretty clear. 
Um, in other cases, we have found PFAS where there have been um, fires, large either uh, building fires or accidents where cars were on fire and AFFF was deployed. There are manufacturing facilities that we've found in some communities that are nearby. The public water supply wells, one of them is a boot manufacturer who uh, made waterproof boots. So that was a pretty obvious target when we started looking around. And the goal is if we can find the source, we can talk about cleaning it up, but we can also talk about uh, the, the party that caused the contamination having responsibility to pay for the remediation, which may include paying for the treatment of a public water supply if the, if the town has to treat its water. So we're trying to work with communities to find the sources of the releases. And then we are doing the sampling and analysis, as I mentioned, the free sampling for the public water systems. And we also have a program where we're sampling private wells in 84, I think, um, towns that either don't have any municipal water supply or more than 60% of the, of the residents are on private wells. We are sampling uh, 40 private wells in each town to sort of get a picture of what's going on in these smaller towns with potential contamination in, in private wells. But Hopkinton is not one of those towns. We have 14 of those towns in this region. So that's what we're doing on a state level. The next slide shows what other regulations are out there. Um, it's a little hard to read, I know it's, it's small, but I include, this, I include this slide because in several of the communities we've, we've met with, there are invariably some people who I've been following PFAS in the news and, and know that EPA is not yet regulating it. They just have this health advisory, which is not enforceable. It's not a regulation. Um, and saying, you know, why is Massachusetts out there on the cutting edge? Why is Massachusetts the only state that's that's doing this? And it, we're not the only state that's doing it. We have been very aggressive. We were one of the first states to have a drinking water standard. But as you can see from the table, Vermont is, is doing uh, 20 for the sum of, of five. We're doing 20 for the sum of six. Um, Maine has an interim standard just recently adopted that is the same as ours, 20 for the sum of six. Other states like New York and New Jersey are regulating individual compounds separately. So there is um, a lot and an increasing amount of regulation going on throughout the country, it's just we happen to be out there in front because frankly, that's that's the way we are. We've been following the science for a long time and, and we didn't think EPA's health advisory was enough. And that's why we took the steps to adopt our regulation last year, which leads me to the next slide, which is last Friday, EPA announced it's, uh, what do they call it? The PFAS strategic roadmap. Um, and the federal government is now taking on PFAS in an extremely comprehensive way. And I just sort of cut and pasted from the, the summary document. It's many, many pages long describing their approach to everything from the way companies manufacture PFAS, the way they use it in their products, whether some of it should be banned, uh, developing more science about the toxicity looking at approaches for permitting and cleanup standards, should PFAS be a chemical that's regulated at Superfund sites, and looking toward remedial goals, how do you clean it up in the environment. Part of the strategic roadmap includes coming up with a federally enforceable drinking water standard by 2023. Um, so a little bit behind us, but uh, there will be regulation at the federal level, it's underway, all that work is underway now, and there's a link on the bottom of this slide to that roadmap. Um, I have it, it just came out on Friday. I'm not sure that it's on our website yet, but I promise you that it will be because we have so much on, on our website already, which brings me to the last slide. If you wanna know anything about PFAS, this is the way you should get there. Just Google MassDEP PFAS. It will take you to this landing page. And if you click on the top link, it will take you to our website and there are hundreds of links that you can get to by clicking on one link. It will take you to other links, will take you to other links. And there is information about everything that you would want to know about PFAS as it's regulated in Massachusetts. It's a much better way of obtaining your information than through Facebook or just Googling PFAS and reading about sites in North Carolina. 
information from Australia. I mean, this is a worldwide problem. I think what you want to know is what's going on in Massachusetts. Look at MassDEP's website. If you want to know what's going on in Hopkinton, look at the town's website. The town's website has a lot of helpful information on it already. And I know it will be updated as more sampling results come in and with updated links to our website if, if we update, when we update our website. So I will stop talking. I'll turn it back to, um, to John. Um, we are, Bob and I are happy to answer questions, um, not only about the public water supply, which was sort of the topic, but if there are people who have private well questions, we can try to, to take those as well. Um, but there is a lot of information for private well owners on our website. So thank you, thank you for listening. I know it was a lot, but I'm happy to be here and, and to take your questions. Mary Jude, thank you very much. That was very informative. A lot of information there uh, answered perhaps a lot of questions, but there may also be a, a lot of questions remaining out there. Uh, we've got the entire panel here. Uh, all I see is a screen full of faces and names. So if you're able to raise your hand, I will try to recognize you and call on you. And then you can unmute yourself and ask any question that you might have. Uh, you can also enter questions in the chat. Scanning the screen, I'm not seeing anyone. So if you do have a question, actually I see Jack's iPhone. If you wanna unmute yourself and ask your question, please. And if you could state your name and address, that'd be helpful for the record. Uh, Jack, you are you are still muted. Sorry, Jack. There you go. I think I, I think I just unmuted. Did I? Okay. Did. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, the the uh, some of the materials that uh, I read that that were distributed from the town. I think talked about the fact that long-term exposure to this is really what the, potentially what the problem is. And so from, I wanted to ask the question from our perspective, my wife and I both being in our seventies have lived in town for 22 years. Um, what is the, def, how do you define long-term exposure? So I, I have to correct you, the, the, Exposures of concern are short-term exposures. These short-term oh, yeah. exposures to pregnant women, nursing mothers, infants, and immune-compromised people are what are driving the, the standard being 20 parts per trillion. It's a short-term exposure, a, a matter of months, not okay. years, for those sensitive populations. So that's, that's mm -hmm. the risk factor that drove MassDEP's regulation. For the longer term, it's less of a risk. And there's no way of telling, you've lived in town forever, there's no way of telling how long you were drinking water that had PFAS in it and what the levels of PFAS might have been because PFAS wasn't regulated. Right. So there was no reason for anybody to be sampling for it. So there's there's really no way to tell what person's a person's past exposure would have been but I just wanna be clear that it's a short-term exposure that is the reason we have the town issue the public, uh, public education and public notice materials. It's not one of these 70 years, two liters of water a day kind of exposure scenarios. Okay, thanks for clearing that up, appreciate it. Sure. I see uh, Paul Bonacito with your hand raised. If you would unmute yourself, please. Hi, uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Paul. I live at 1 Oakhurst Road uh, in Hopkinson. Um, I guess I have just two, two questions, really. Um, in, in, and I don't know if this is for, for Mary or for someone from the town, but are there any obvious or even anecdotal um, uh, reasons or s sources that caused, may have caused the contamination at Fruit Street? Um, that, that's one. And, and if so, uh, is it, what are the, What's the likelihood of this being mitigated or remediated um, in the near future? And my, and my second question is, um, is, is there any um, water filtration system that other towns have used 
that have successfully either mitigated or remediated PFAS from either the town's the town source uh, and or um, a home, uh, you know, a whole house um, water filtration system. That's that's all I have. So there are treatment systems on um, many public water systems across the Commonwealth already. I mean, there the two main ones are um, carbon. Uh, granular activated carbon, which is sort of, uh, Leah Stanton and, and Bob Bostrick are gonna cringe when I say this, but they're just like giant Brita filters, giant, giant, like 10 foot tall Brita filters. Um, so carbon takes out PFAS and then this uh, ion exchange technology, those are the two primary ones that we're seeing public water systems use and they get the water down to non-detect. When Bob and his staff permit these treatment systems, the permit, requires them to treat to non-detect. And that is working in multiple communities across the state. And I forgot the first part of your question. Uh, the, first part, the first part was just, do we know is, is why Fruit Street is contaminated? Is there oh, something right. obvious or? Yeah. So, so as I said, when we, when we get a report of, uh, we get lab analysis from a public water system and it shows that there's a PFAS detection we look at our Bureau of Waste Site Cleanup starts looking to see what might be around there. As I said, in, in one town, there was a boot factory very close to the wells. Um, in our first blush, our, our first look through the Fruit Street area, we're not seeing anything except the highway. Um, but what we do is rely on people in town to try to tell us what was where back in the day. You know, there's always somebody who remembers when there was a dump or, you know, there was a chemical storage area or there was a junkyard fire, you know, so if there is information that the town has that would allow us to have a starting point to look for something, that's what we would do. Right now, the only idea that we have is, is possibly deployment of foam on a, a vehicle fire on the, on the highway. Thank you. So there is a chance that this could be a one-off or the next testing, it could, it could come back as favorable at Fruit Street. I don't think so. Thank you. I mean, I think, I think, it, I mean, we have multiple months of results. I don't think it's going to go away. Anyone else with a question for the panel? Uh, I don't see any hands raised in the chat group, but if you want to raise your hand, I see uh, Marcy Reynolds. If you would unmute yourself, please. Uh, Marcy, you just need to unmute. There you go. There I go. Let me just turn uh, Marcy, my volume. You just need to unmute. There you go. Okay. There I go. <laughs> so I have a question regarding the Fruit Street Wells. So I have a question regarding the fruit street wells. It's my understanding that artificial turf is a potential big contaminant. Artificial turf is a potential big contaminant. So is that, is that a question? Um, has anyone looked into the possibility of the artificial turf that was originally put down or that's recently been replaced? Is that a potential? There's yeah, there's information about artificial turf. Um, we looked at this in response to a similar question in a, in a different town. Um, and what our, um, our waste site cleanup program found when they looked at sort of the leachability of the materials used in the turf was that it was at extremely low levels. So if you've seen some information, some data that it's a significant problem, I'm not aware of that. It's not something that we've found in our own investigations, which is why, you know, if you have a question, I think there probably is that information about the turf on our website. And if it's not, I can get you more specific information, but it's, it's better to look at EPA, DEP, ATSDR for information than just sort of general internet research. I uh, see Dave Roberts has his hand Thank up. You. Uh, I see Dave Roberts. Uh, Dave, just need oh, to. There you go. Yeah. Um, 
So, so in a nutshell, in the chat, we, we've kind of already been asking the question. It, it seems like well six is the culprit. Is there a reason we can't just take that well offline? Uh, Mr. Roberts, uh, well number six is one of our greatest producing wells. And if we were to take that offline totally, we wouldn't be able to meet the daily demands of the community. So that's what we're doing- Very succinct and valuable answer. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, to Mr. Roberts, that, you had a, I'm sorry, John. No, that's quite all right. To further that, what we're doing is we are, there's a blending facility that was built there. So we're able to combine all the water from wells one and two and six together. And we built that blending facility to remove or lower the concentration of manganese. So we are working with our engineers to try to find a sweet spot of blending where we're blending out the manganese and uh, trying to lower the PFAS levels, but that has been unsuccessful to date. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. You, Mr. Roberts, you had a question in the chat also about reverse osmosis systems for your, for your house. Uh, I um, was more chatting with the other people. So I-, I Okay, but I, it's, I, it's a point I'd like to make, um, if, if, in particular for private well owners, but if anybody's thinking about buying an RO system for their house, um, we don't recommend the use of RO systems. They waste a lot of water. I think it's something like for one gallon of water, you've got three gallons of waste. And if you have PFAS in the water, we don't want you putting the PFAS water back into the ground. We don't want you putting it into your septic system because it gets back into the ground. So um, there are carbon units that you can buy. They're not certified to get to 20, but they are certified to get to 70. If you go on the NSF website, getting down, you know, it, it's taking out PFAS. It's just not certified to get to 20, but um, the RO systems would require, if you're discharging it to like a dry well, would require a permit from MassDEP and we're not gonna give you that permit. So I would be very reluctant to steer anybody in the direction of an RO system, unless it's going into the sewer. Ms. Pigsley, if I could, there's a couple of questions in the chat, which I'll read now. Uh, one comes uh, and asks, will there be reimbursement for folks who feel it's necessary to purchase bottled water now that we have uh, violated the standard, we have 30 days to develop a, uh, an alternative water supply for those folks that are not able to or do not wish to drink the, the PFAS water. So we have 30 days to determine that and it's likely that we will come up with something related to either uh, reimbursement or a credit to people's water accounts, but that, that's forthcoming. Um, and then, Another question here, which perhaps Ms. Pigsley can answer. What are the PFAS levels for the Howe Street wells in Ashland to provide water to Hopkinton? I'm gonna rely on Bob Bostwick to tell me that. Ashland is not in our region, but all of the information for the entire state is available on um, what's called the EEA data portal, Executive Office of Energy and Environment. Um, you can Google that. Um, if you go onto that data portal, they call it the data lake. I love all these tech terms. The data lake has all of the data and it's searchable by the name of the public water supply and PFAS. If you were interested in seeing the lead levels in Hopkinton, the manganese levels, you could search on those as well, but you can search on um, Ashland and the, that well and PFAS and you can get all the data that's there. Bob has easier ways to do that. So we had, uh, Bob can uh, can check and tell us what the, the levels are in Ashland. Um, thank you, Mary Jude. I actually just used the, the data portal myself. Um, there you go. Because again, it's outside of my region. And um, they did do sampling back in July and August of this year at the Howe Street Water Treatment Plant. In July, the result was 5.77 parts per trillion. And in August, it was 9.3 parts per trillion. So they won't be on monthly sampling because they're below 10. So the next time they sample, they, they have to sample in October for the fourth quarter of this year. So there should be, the sampling takes about three weeks for lab turnaround time. So, you know, at some point in early to mid November, the more recent results should be available through that data portal. And, and and just as a as a helpful hint, when you're doing the search oh. 
on the portal. If you search for PFAS six as the contaminant that you're looking for, it will give you the sum of the five of the six contaminants uh, can, uh, PFAS contaminants together. So you won't have to get the entire list of everything that was sampled and start doing the math. Uh, there's a question in the chat. Will zero filters, and that sounds like a brand name, will zero filters remove PFAS? I, I don't know. I don't know what that is. If, um, if you want to see on the NSF website, you can see if it's certified to remove some PFAS. But as I said, there's nothing certified that will get you um, proven below 20 for the six PFAS compounds that we regulate. There's another question here. Do you offer a timeline for how long it will take to rectify the situation? We have switched to buying all bottled water and found it to be very expensive. Uh, Mary Jude Pigsley, would you uh, reiterate what those timelines are for the short term and long term? So what we're what we're asking, so, so because now we have three months in the quarter, we have a violation for the third quarter. Um, what the town will receive a notice of non-compliance, which says you violated the PFAS standard um, in 30 days, from 30 days from that notice, when that goes out from Bob, there'll be a requirement for the town to develop a short-term plan to provide an alternative water source for the sensitive subpopulations, pregnant women, nursing mothers, infants, and immune compromised individuals, or come up with a plan that involves blending, taking a source offline, getting water through an interconnection with another community, um, some plan that's for the short term to, to uh, mitigate the exposures to the sensitive populations. In another 30 days after that, we are looking for a long-term plan and that may be treatment, that may be a new well, that may be relying completely on water from somewhere else. And we are aware that those, those long-term plans can take years. Um, if you are going to build a, a new treatment plant or construct a new well, you have to go to town meeting to authorize the borrowing, you have to borrow the money from our SRF program, you know, it's, it's, you have to design it, you have to build it. So it's a years long process, regardless, uh, unless, unless you are tied into a community that has abundant water and you can just flip a valve and start buying all your water from them, which is not the case here. Um, so that long-term plan will spell out those steps. So the town in the next couple of months will develop a plan and tell us what it is and how long they project that it will take. But it, it requires some careful thought. Thank you very much. And then does anyone know if there were any fires at the Pine Sand and Gravel Company on Fruit Street? There were a lot of tires left in that area. Don't know if the fire chief can weigh in on that. Hi, John. Uh, not that I know of. Nothing significant that we would have used uh, that much quantity of foam for. Thank you very much. And then finally, in the chat, does a faucet filter help in the interim? As I said, if you get one that's certified to remove PFAS, it will remove some PFAS. Whether it removes it down to zero, whether it removes it down to 20, there's no way of saying, if you get something that's certified, it will tell you that it will be below 70 parts per trillion for PFOA and PFOS, the two things that EPA has a health advisory for. So if, if you're thinking some reduction is better than no reduction, then that's true. I mean, it will reduce the PFAS. I just can't tell you how much. Um, I can tell you that nothing is certified to get to below 20 for the six. Thank you. Um, looking in the uh, list of folks that are here, I don't see any hands raised. I don't see anything else in the chat room. Uh, I see uh, Suzanne Tucci. If you would please unmute yourself. My wife and I are here. Um, thank you for taking my, uh, my question. Um, we've been re uh, researching the bottled water issue. And that was the recommendation on the uh, uh, information we got from Hopkinton. Um, I've been to a Home Depot and I've been to Lowe's and uh, each one on the label has a water uh, a phone number to call for information. And um, it hasn't been, it also on the top of the water cap, it said it was reverse osmosis purified. 
And I'm led to believe that the purified is a, is a good water to drink. But the question is, I don't know the PFAS level of those waters. And that's my concern. I don't want to spend uh, four or $500 a year on five gallon jugs to find out that it's got more PFAS than Hopkinton does. What's my alternative? Go on our website. I've been, I've, been the, I've, been to, I've been to the water bar website, but no, the Lowe's water or the Home Depot water is not listed. And anything else is like, you know, uh, Evian from France, a uh, 16 or 22 ounce bottle. I mean, we're talking gallons a year. So I've been to the, and they didn't have, uh, and that's all voluntary too, from what I understand. Those people in giving Massachusetts that information, is that correct? If you, if you want to buy your bottle of water from Home Depot, and Home Depot is not on the list, it's up to you, but the Department of Public Health has a list of all the water companies that have voluntarily tested and meet all of our drinking water standards, include P, including PFAS. There are many, many bottled water companies on that list, and you can choose one of those. But if you're, for some reason, dead set on buying your water at Home Depot, I would look on the back and see where that water is actually coming from and check to see if that source is on the list. There, you know, you have a, there's a, there's a water company that I don't, I won't name, but they just bottle water from the municipal system where they are. So if you live in that town and you buy that bottled water, you're getting the same water that's coming out of your tap. It's just, you know, but you can, you can be sure that the bottled water companies on the Department of Public Health website have met the standards. Just because they did it voluntarily doesn't mean that it's not it's not accurate. So you can you can check that and then go buy that water. And they are, I, I can tell you when we're when we're doing site investigations and we discover um, contaminated private wells and we provide bottled water, which is in some circumstances we have to do for people, um, we use one of the companies on that list. So it's it's a reliable list. Well, for the people who are looking at Home Depot, and it's an obvious uh, go-to for me, uh, and I think for a lot of other people, and Lowe's. By the way, it's the same, it's different name brands, by the way, for each of those uh, retailers, but it's the same water source in, uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. And they said to be to go to waters.com, which is a big marketing site that wants to promote their water. I have no idea. They, they, they told me, but I couldn't. I couldn't verify the fact that it was uh, uh, 70 PP, uh, uh, PPTs. Uh, so I don't know uh, if you had any information on that, or if anybody's complained about it or, or anything of that nature. But, uh, you know, um, I've been on the site and I didn't see anything that I could locally buy um, in five gallon jugs. Well, I'm not, I, I can't. Again, I can't speak to Home Depot, and there are a lot of places that sell bottled water. Um, I'm not, I'm not advocating for any particular brand, but our water supply, our our contractors who provide water provide Poland Springs and five gallon jugs. I'm not sure why that's so hard to find on the list. Poland Springs and other Nestle, whatever brands, Nestle manufacturers under under different brands. I, I really encourage you to get off the Home Depot website and go to the Mass DEP website. Is there another question? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, Kathleen Waldron, I see your hand raised. If you would turn off, uh, unmute yourself and please go ahead. Yeah, hi, uh, Kathleen Waldron, 11 Waybridge Lane. I am not high risk, I'm in my seventies um, and I'm really reluctant to add more plastic to the ocean. So I don't really wanna buy bottled water if I don't need to. And I'm getting the sense that it's okay for me to continue to drink Hopkinton water at this time. Um, can you address that? Everybody has different comfort levels with risk. You know, there are people who drive without seatbelts. There are people who smoke. Um, the decisions that you make are totally up to you. What we do is provide you the information. The information in the public information materials and what I've spoken to tonight talks about our standard having been set to be the most protective of that sensitive group, the pregnant women, nursing mothers, infants, and immune compromised people who may be exposed over a short period of time. If you're not in that group, you are not in the high risk. You are definitely at a lesser risk, certainly not developing 
the things uh, on the you know the fifth or sixth slide about developmental issues, you know, fetal development, the, the things that we're protecting against would not apply to you. Um, so you have to take that information and use it in a way that you feel comfortable. So we can communicate the information, but you have to make your own personal decisions if you want to talk to your healthcare provider to figure out what level of risk that you want you feel comfortable with. And if that's buying water, bottled water, great. Um, if it's, you know, I, I did one public hearing, public meeting about PFAS where a gentleman in the back of the room stood up and said, you know, when am I going to get this cancer? When am I going to get cancer? You know, if you can't tell me when I'm going to get, I'm doing, I'm going to, I've been drinking this water all my life and I'm fine. So okay, that's, that's your choice. You know, that's, that's great. You know, people, people come at these things from very different perspectives and the best person to listen to is yourself. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? I don't see any hand raise, hands raised in the uh, chat room, and I'm looking across the screen to see if anyone has their, their real hands raised, and I'm not seeing any. Uh, if I'm missing you, please speak up. Otherwise, uh, we're going to wrap up this meeting. Uh, there's one more uh, piece of information here in the, in the website uh, chat room. It says the premium five-stage zero filter wall zero water filter is reported by manufacturer to reduce PFOS. I would take Mary Jude's comment that it could reduce the concentration, but not eliminate it to zero. And, and PFOS is one of the six that we regulate. So PFAS is the term we use for all the per and polyfluoral alkyl substances together, but PFOS is a specific one that I think is a component of firefighting foam. Um, so that's just one of the six. Thank you. Um, I see uh, Suzanne Tucci. Mr. Tucci, your hand raised again. Uh, does the Nestle's or uh, Poland Springs, do they give you a, uh, a PFAS number? They do not. They just certify that they're in compliance with all of the mass DEP regulations. And uh, if I saw somebody that, that touts the fact that their water is uh, treated reverse osmosis, would that be uh, a good thing? I don't know. Wow. Thank you. Uh, last call. I don't, want to, I don't want to miss anybody. I don't see anyone's hands or anything. So with that, I wish to thank all of our panelists, uh, especially Mary Jude Pigsley and Bob Bostwick of Mass DEP. I will remind folks that if you're looking for additional information, you can go to the Mass DEP website or the Town of Hopkinton DPW website. There is a tremendous amount of information on both of those websites. You can also reach out to me here at the Department of Public Works, 508-497-9740. You can email me, jwesterling at hopkingtonma.gov. Uh, and finally, tonight's meeting is uh, being recorded and it will be available on our DPW website if you wish to go back and hear any of the information that was provided tonight. Otherwise, uh, look forward to future information as this develops from the town of Hopkinton. And I appreciate everyone's attendance and patience and involvement in tonight's meeting. So thank you very much to everybody. Thank you for inviting us. You're welcome. Have Thank you. Night. Thank you. Thanks.